Hi, I'm Dave Ehrenberg, a.k.a. the Florida Lawman. And it's time to get inside the criminal mind with Dr. Rachel Needle and Sasha Craver of Legal Psych here on True Crime MTN. Hello, my name is Sasha Craver, and this is Legal Psych by True Crime MTN. I'm joined here by my co-host, Dr. Rachel Needle, legal psychologist and forensic expert. We're going to be talking about the Menendez brothers case. Welcome, Dr. Rachel. I'm really excited for this one. Such an interesting case. So interesting. Thanks, Sash. And, um, you know, I'm sure you've all heard about this case. It's actually an older case, but it's come back in the media. There's been a lot of contention on, you know, why this happened. So this is what we're going to kind of be talking about today as we go through the entire story chronologically. And I go back and forth and ask Dr. Rachel, um, you know, questions about this is it's not the if they killed their parents, it's why they killed their parents. So the Menendez parents, Jose and Kitty, got married in 1963, and they had two kids, Lyle and Eric. They ended up settling down in an upper-class neighborhood in New Jersey. So Jose became a studio executive at Live Entertainment. This is where he would go on to make his fortune. He ended up becoming an executive. He made a lot of money. Um, and Jose, to get to the top, was said to be very tough in both his business life and his personal life. He is said to have ruled with an iron fist. This extended to his kids as well. He was said to be somewhat of a bully um, and his kids never could live up to his standard. He had very high expectations for them. So Lyle and Eric were very close growing up. Eric looked up to Lyle a lot. Um, Jose was very into sports. So naturally the kids ended up getting into sports and they ended up choosing tennis. Um, I believe Eric, the younger brother, or Lyle, sorry, the younger brother ended up actually becoming very good at tennis and tried to go pro later on in his life. Um, now, the brothers had issues, a few issues that we know of growing up. And I think this is important to touch upon as we're talking about this story. Um, so it is said that they were at one point wrestling with a female cousin and they ended up, Lyle and Eric, taking off her clothes, tying her up and she started screaming and only then did they stop. Um, there's another story of Lyle touching her cousin, his cousin in inappropriate ways. Um, Lyle also suffered from insomnia and wetted the bed up until age 14. Dr. Rachel, what does this tell you about these very young boys? So play like this can be a result of the perpetrator having themselves been a victim of sexual abuse. So perhaps something like this was done to them. This is their way sometimes of acting out and trying to cope with the trauma that they themselves were a victim of. Um, and, and, you know, there's different types of, of experimentation, but certainly the tying up part is the part that is concerning. And you wonder, was this experimentation, was this acting out something that's happened to them, which is a good possibility. Right. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting you mentioned the connection between that and the abuse because, you know, um, we will go on to learn that a different cousin of theirs, um, Diane Vandermolen, actually came to stay with the brothers in 1976. And she claimed during the trial that Lyle revealed that he was being molested by his father at this time. Um, and that it also was reported to Kitty, the mother, and that Kitty did not do anything about it. Now, Dr. Rachel, how does this affect a child of that age, assuming that this is true? And what does this tell us about the mother, Kitty Menendez? Yeah, so it, it is common for a, a spouse, especially in a relationship that might have also been abusive towards her. So, you know, we don't know much about their relationship, but certainly if he was a tyrant and we saw this with his children and we saw the psychological abuse there and then at work, potentially that that was also the dynamic that existed between he and his wife. Um, but it definitely became evident throughout the trial as well that the brothers were almost angrier at her, um, likely because they saw it as, why didn't you stop this? Um, why didn't you help us? So the parent who is supposed to be the nurturing one, we're supposed to depend on for safety and security, um, just sat by. Not only did one of them actually potentially you know, was the perpetrator of, you know, sexual and psychological abuse. But when another one sits by, it's doubly as painful and, and traumatic. Oh, exactly. And it, it is said that Jose and Kitty did not have the best of relationships. They did fight a lot. Um, Jose had a, a string of affairs that Kitty eventually find, found out about. So, you know, to your point, there is that potential that Kitty was actually scared of him. And also, you know, I think also you don't want to believe that 
your partner could be capable of doing that to someone you love, right? So that could have played into her decision making. And, you know, when she, assuming this is all true, you know, decided not to do anything about it or believe her, you know, sons. Um, and, and a so, lot of times just in denial, right? So if there right. are some red flags or some indications, just, you know, it's it's easy to kind of be in denial there, especially when you're fearful yourself. Both both of the consequences, potentially physically, psychologically, but also financially. Right, right. So, you know, moving into their teen and their young adult years, um, they end up moving to Beverly Hills. Um, the dad's making a lot of money as an executive. Um, the boys start having even more issues. Neither excelled in school. Um, Lyle, you know, being from New Jersey, really wanted to go to Princeton. He ends up getting rejected. As you can imagine from what we know about Jose Menendez, he must not have been happy about this. Um, Lyle ends up attending community college. He wants to open a restaurant. Um, you know, as I said, his parents aren't happy about all of this. They refuse to give him the money for the restaurant. He eventually gets accepted to prison, uh, to Princeton, gets accused of plagiarism, and then gets kicked out. So now you have the, the son that couldn't get into Princeton that goes on his own path, eventually gets into prison, and then gets kicked out almost immediately for plagiarism. He then moves to California. He moves back in with his parents. Um, and Jose gives him a job at Live Entertainment, the company that he is an executive at, and he ends up getting fired. Um, so once again, what we know about Jose Menendez, this did not fare over very well for him. Now, Eric was a little different than than Lyle. He was said to be more of the sensitive one, more shy or a little bit more emotional. Um, he was also closer to their mom, Kitty, but he was also very close to Lyle. So, um, you know, being the younger brother, Eric was is now at this time 17, 18 years old. So they're all living in Beverly Hills together. The brothers start robbing their parents' friends' houses. It's said that they stole up to, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Eventually, the police find stuff in their trunk. They get arrested. Um, the dad works a deal with police and they get no jail time. Um, but the brothers have to start attending counseling. Dad pays back the victims, but essentially they serve no jail time for stealing hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, it's at this time that Eric Menendez um, allegedly writes a screenplay about a teenager who kills his rich parents to get their inheritance. He shows it to Lyle and they allegedly at this time hatch a plan to kill their parents. Um, now we do know that at this time that Kitty Menendez starts seeing a therapist and that therapist, um, she admits to that therapist that she's scared of her children and that she locks the door at night. Um, and she thinks her kids also might be sociopaths. So very important, interesting piece of information to note. Um, now let's talk about the day of the murders. We're looking at August of 1989. This is what we know happens. The parents are watching a movie. The boys walk into the room, they're using shotguns, and they hit Jose multiple times. At one point, one of the brothers places a shotgun to the back of his head and pulls the trigger, completely blew out the back of Jose's head. So this is a brutal murder. Um, Kitty, the mother, tries to run. She shot multiple times. At this point, she's crawling on the floor. They actually run out of ammo, have to go back to their car, reload, come back, and um, they shoot Kitty fatally. Um, so they, they shot Katie a total of 10 times in short range. They then make the 911 call. And this is really important because this call is going to be played, um, you know, during their trial. Lyle and Eric put on a show. As, as I said from the beginning, they eventually did admit to this murder. Okay. At this time, though, you know, their plan isn't to admit to the murder. For whatever reason, they did it. They're not admitting to it, obviously. So they put on a show. Um, they start screaming and freaking out. Eric starts running around and trying to ram his head into a tree. He's just having a complete mental breakdown. Now, whether or not this is, you know, he, whether or not he's putting on a show or maybe he actually, you know, after having done what he did and what he felt he had to do, it, you know, put him to the point where he started going crazy. You know, I think you could make one argument to the other, depending on whose story you believe. Um now, there's a difference between the brothers when they are questioned by attorneys, um, a distinct difference. Eric is um, distraught. He's extremely emotional. As we've said, This the younger brother is the more emotional of the two. Lyle is very unemotional and very controlled. Um, now, during the funeral, the boys were an hour late. Um, once again, Eric 
emotional, distraught. He cried the entire funeral. Lyle is completely calm and doesn't show much emotion. Um, now, Lyle does get on the stand and talks about how much he loved his parents, how much he misses them, but he's not shedding a tear the way that Eric is. So, Dr. Rachel, I have a question. What does this tell you about the difference between the two brothers? I mean, they're both committed to the mur they both committed the murders, but yet the two brothers are acting so very different. Yeah, and it's not surprising. So everybody responds differently to trauma, and all of these can be common presentations, right? So, you know, victims of prolonged sexual violence are highly complex individuals. So some will experience prolonged psychological trauma, others will have no distress. And, you know, oftentimes we, we know that there is um, a sense of um, immediacy in their actions. They can't control their emotions. They struggle. You know, we have seen that research has repeatedly seen actually that, that there could be a number of psychological sequelae and serious impact on mental and emotional and developmental health. Um, so, you know, it sounds like, again, they are very like almost like their brains stop developing at a certain age, right? That they're very immature for their age. Um, whether or not they're sociopath, that's something that psychological testing can help with. And it's very um, good at predicting malingering. And so I would love to see what that what that looked like if I could, you know, look at the actual scores from that testing. Um, but after multiple traumas, you may have anxiety, depression, um, erratic behavior, even uh, be prone to violence. Um, so it sounds like Again, when, when they were acting differently, potentially one might have been dissociated during the act and then all of a sudden realizing what they had done starts freaking out. Um, and so we don't really know kind of, you know, what was going on there, but that would be some of the things that could be coming up. And I don't think it's surprising that they're acting differently. Right, right. So, um, you know, and going into, you know, their, their actions after they killed their parents, um, this is important, all of this to note, because the prosecution would then use this as evidence against them. Um, they did end up going on a spending spree. Um, within days of the murder, the boys went on a spending spree, lighting money on fire. They made a series of bad financial decisions. Um, they bought cars, Rolexes, which they actually wore the Rolexes to the funeral. Um, Eric invested $40,000 in a concert, um, and that guy ends up taking off with the money Eric hires a private tennis private tennis coach um, to attempt to go pro. We spent about sixty thousand dollars on that. So in a span of four months, we're looking at you know about a million dollars spent. And keep in mind, this is in the the late eighties, um, early nineties. So an investigation takes place. Um, the boys are not the immediate suspects. Lyle finds out that there was a new will that the parents had made right before. They killed them. Um, we do know that he deleted that will and created a new copy um, and then also had a computer expert erase all of the memory on his parents' computer. Now, this is the very interesting part. Eric, the younger, more emotional brother, starts seeing a therapist. Now, Dr. Uziel will play a very important part of this story. Um, Eric and Lyle at this point weren't getting along. You know, they're both spending a bunch of money there. They just killed their parents. They end up getting into a lot of fights. Eric is really not handling all of this well. Um, so he starts seeing Dr. Oziel. And in October, Eric cracks and tells him everything. What he says to the therapist who was recording these sessions is that the brothers were watching Billionaire's Boys Club. And that around that time, the dad had threatened to cut them out of the will and that that's when the boys came up with a plan to kill their parents. And he starts detailing the crime to his therapist. Now, the doctor at this point asks Lyle to join the session. Um, the boys meet again with Dr. Ozeal. As you can imagine, knowing what we know about Lyle, he's a little bit less emotional. Um, Lyle's very upset at Eric for, um, for spilling the beans, essentially. And the boys meet again with Dr. Ozeal, and this is where the boys threaten to kill him. And, um, you know, around that same time, a friend of Eric's actually had gone to the police with a similar story. But, you know, Eric had told the story to his friend in third person. If I were to kill my parent, this is what I would have done, um, you know, which doesn't play well in court. But you have Dr. Ozeal, who is recording these therapy sessions. The detectives at this point know that it is the brothers. They get a search warrant 
for the 17 tapes. There are 17 recorded sessions with Dr. Ozeal. Eric and Lyle get arrested and they get charged with the murder of their parents. The LA district attorney says that the murder was a product of greed and that they're adding special circumstances onto the charges, meaning that they could end up on death row. Um, they also find the store where the guns are purchased. The guns are purchased under Donovan J. Goodrow's name, a friend of Lyle's. His ID was used without his permission to buy these guns. The boys then hire lawyers um, and they are arraigned. Now, at this point during their arraignment, they're full-blown celebrities. So I think this is an, an important thing to note as we talk about their facade and how they acted during their arraignment. They are, this is blown up in the media. I mean, I, I wanna ask you, Dr. Rachel, you know, people are obsessed with certain cases. Do you think it was the fact that it was, you know, two brothers killing their parents? I mean, the murders happen all the time, unfortunately, but I mean, this is, we're talking about it today, right? I mean, what about it is so fascinating? I think a number of things. I think, you know, again, it was also a high profile one. So their father had a high profile and, you know, in the entertainment industry, especially where, you know, we, we tend to, to be more drawn towards. Um, but also two brothers, a gruesome murder, and just a lot of questions about, you know, how this could happen. Um, you know, were they, you know, you know, was it psychologically motivated or, or was it motivated by greed or was it motivated, you know, by um, being fearful that, you know, the parents were either going to kill them or that this was going to continue to happen, getting out of their father's sort of reign. Um, and we have to also remember that it could have been different for both of them. So as I hear you talk, it reminds me that like, the motives might have been different for each of them. They are very different people. So you see Lyle not having that type of emotion. So, you know, it, it begs the question is, you know, people are so fascinated by, you know, killers and why people kill. And does it mean you're a sociopath or can you actually have a conscience and not conscience and have reasons why you did that? And I think people, you know, themselves sort of vacillate and should they be, you know, in treatment, should they, you know, be in prison for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, and I think in any situation where there is this much evidence that abuse occurred in the long term, that treatment is really, you know, what's needed. Right. And I think, you know, back to your point about, you know, you have these two wealthy kids. This is something that you don't normally see, right? Two very wealthy kids living in Beverly Hills with their parents, it seems like this family has the world that they have everything right and then the boys go on to brutally murder their parents this is something that just you know is fascinating to us because we don't see something like this often right it's usually not like the family that seems like they have everything together um so, and, and that's the thing yeah. that i think is also important here is to remember that mental illness doesn't discriminate you know abuse doesn't discriminate this happens to people of all socioeconomic status cultures uh, religions, um, you know, and, and genders. Right. Yeah. So, um, you know, at, at this point, um, you know, we're going into the arraignments and, um, you know, the boys are said to act to the point of, you know, they just became celebrities. So maybe this potentially could be part of the reason why, but, but they were said to act very smugly and arrogant and that they liked the media attention. Of course, that's, just how they are per perceived by the public at this time, um, you know. So d does that strike you as interesting or do you think that, you know, they're just being put under a lot of pressure? I mean, I think it could be either, right? It could be that they're really enjoying this attention. It's a different kind of attention than they've gotten in the past um, and that it could be a defense. You know, it's easier to respond like that than to feel, which we know that, you know, they obviously struggle with, with all the dissoci dissociation that we've seen them exhibit with some of their actions. Right. Um, so I, I think it could be potentially they're, they're getting the spotlight for the first time where their father usually has been the one to get that. They received all these messages of being inadequate and all these impossible standards to live up to. And here they are getting this attention and almost like, you know, even though it's for a negative context, right, that they killed, they're getting all this attention of, uh, um, all of a sudden, like, Hey, we made it, you know? Right. Um, and so that, that, even though that sounds like a warped reason and, and a warped sense of, of thinking that that could be a way that their brain is thinking when all of a sudden they're getting all of the, you know, this publicity and, and, um, attention. 
And I do want to note, because this is important um, moving forward as we continue to tell the story, that they're they are all dressed up. Um, you know, they're in a, a suit and tie and, and all of that for their arraignment. And you'll see that the boys kind of do change a lot during um, and throughout the trial. So, um, you know, we're going to get into a lot of other stuff in this the second episode. Um, you know, there's a lot more to talk about. There's going to be an entire uh, a war on the, releasing these tapes, these tapes that are usually protected by patient, um, you know, doctor, patient, therapist, patient privilege. Right. So there's this entire uh, it goes all the way up, actually, to the California Supreme Court. And then we get into kind of the trial and then the media aftermath of that trial. We want to hear from you all. Please comment on the video. Let us know what you think. Do you think the brothers did it? Why do you think they murdered their parents, if so? Also, let us know if you have any requests for other um, cases for future videos. I'm Dr. Rachel Needle with my co-host, Sasha Craver, on Legal Psych by True Crime MTN. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. I'm Dave Ehrenberg, a.k.a. the Florida Lawman, here on the fastest-growing true crime channel, True Crime MTN. And we'll see you next time.